So my name is Ryan Wolf, uh, and in addition to uh, acting as this evening's moderator, I have the privilege of serving as the director of ISI's Collegiate Network, the home of independent student journalism. Um, and as I said, we'll be discussing the future of the conservative movement tonight in light of uh, the election. Um, you know, the results are still a little up in the air, but we want to take kind of a, a big picture look at what these results might mean for um, the conservative movement and conservative policies and institutions in the future. So our, our conversation tonight features two of uh, the leading thinkers on this topic. Uh, one is Matthew Connetti, who is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, where his work is focused on American political thought and history with a particular focus on the development of the Republican Party and the American conservative movement in the 20th century. Uh, a prominent journalist, analyst, author, and an intellectual historian of the right, uh, Mr. Connetti was a founding editor and editor-in-chief of the Washington Free Beacon, and he was previously opinion editor at the Weekly Standard. We also have Warren Cass, who is the executive director of American Compass, uh, a uh, nonprofit whose mission is to restore an economic consensus that emphasizes the importance of family, community, and industry to the nation's liberty and prosperity. Prior to founding American Compass, Warren held roles as a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. He was a domestic policy advisor for Mitt Romney's 2012 presidential campaign uh, and a management consultant at Bain and Companies Boston and Delhi offices. And he is the author of The Once and Future Worker, a vision for the renewal of work in America. So throughout the webinar tonight, um, if you want to ask uh, either or both of our guests a question, please feel free to submit one using the Q&A tab located on the right side of your screen. I'll try to get as uh, many audience questions in as possible at the end of our conversation. Uh, in the meantime, uh, feel free to make comments and engage in conversation with other attendees using the chat box. So uh, thank you guys for joining us tonight. I'll start kind of with um, a historical question for Matt. So uh, over history um, has kind of electoral consequences shifted the conservative movement's direction or has the conservative movement shifted the GOP and has that led to, you know, poor or good electoral consequences uh, for the party? Well, uh, thank you, Ryan, and thank you, everybody uh, from ISI, and thank you, Oren. Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think if you look back at the history of the conservative movement and its relationship with the Republican Party, um, I think you'd find that the conservative movement had more of an influence on the Republican Party than um, ele election results had on the conservatism um, and of course, you know, if you just think about it, uh, one of the biggest uh, election defeats in, in his in American history was in 1964, when the conservative hero, Barry Goldwater, um, went down um, by something like uh, by an incredible margin um, to Lyndon Johnson. And of course, uh, in the decades since, the Republican Party has become more conservative um, in different, different ways, um, not necessarily in Barry Goldwater's ways. Um, but not less. And um, so I think if you look at the development of uh, the supply side ideology that influenced Ronald Reagan's campaign, if you look at the development of a lot of the civil society thinkers uh, in the um, 1990s that influenced compassionate conservatism, and you can kind of see how the conservative intellectual establishment has played a role in, um, in kind of driving Republican Party debates. Now, a great exception to this is the past uh, four years, uh, which is that um, what one of the things that 2016 made clear was that there was a divide between um, the conservative grassroots and many conservative elites, primarily in Washington, DC. And there, this disconnect between the two, uh, I think led to um, not only estrangement on the part of a lot of the conservative elites from their own movement, um, but also created the space uh, for, uh, for new thinking and, and in, in a way, a more, uh, voter driven, um, change in, in the way that conservative intellectuals thought about things. So, so the one big exception, uh, to, to the conservative movement's influence on the GOP would be the past four years. And, 
you know, I think that exception has actually been fruitful in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Right. So, so Oren, um, kind of a similar question to you. Um, do you kind of, uh, see the GOP shift in 2016, uh, as being driven by kind of, uh, the electorate and that leading to kind of the change in GOP's philosophy? And do you think kind of having a more, um, you know, working class focus is going to be uh, kind of where the conservative movement heads uh, looking forward? Well, I'm, I'm not sure if the, if the GOP actually changed that much. I mean, if, if you in the last four years, if, if you remove Trump, the, the individual from the top, or even you look at how he governed, you look at the, the one thing he did when when the GOP had control in, in his first two years was, of course, a, a large tax cut. Um, you know, you, you look at who's surrounding him here at the end of his first term. It's Larry Kudlow and Art Laffer and Steve Moore and and so on and so forth. There's there, there's a way in which um, I don't think the GOP has actually necessarily changed. And and so that that, in my mind, at least speaks to the, the interesting anomaly related to what Matt was describing, if, if you compare it to something like Goldwater, um, I, I agree exactly with what you said, that I, I think the conservative movement and, and thinking has sort of evolved and guided the party. Um, but but I think it's it, it is changes in the electorate. And, and, you know, some of those are kind of driven by macro conditions. Some of those are driven by political realignments um, that exactly, as he said, sort of create the space for new work and, and new thinking to be done. And, and what's very strange this time around and makes it look so different is that, that Trump won in, in 2016. I mean, the, the way this is supposed to work, you know, if, if you take Goldwater as the example, is he, he was, you know, incredibly iconoclastic. He, he, I think, set off what ultimately led to Reagan, but then he also got wiped out and, and the work then gets, gets done in the wilderness, so to speak. I think you see a similar thing with the Democrats with the Democratic Leadership Council kind of rising in the wake of, of Reagan's success in Mondale's disaster, it takes about a decade to, to lead to Clinton in, in 92. And so, uh, you know, what I see happening with, within the Republican Party and, and on the right of center generally is, is there was a need to do some rethinking. You know, you, you, what made sense for Reagan in 1980 can, can last only so long. Um, and, and then you have this sort of disruption, both in economic uh, forces and a candidate like Trump, and, and then all that rethinking that, that Matt was describing has to happen. Uh, it's just very strange that it was happening with Trump in the White House. That, that, that in a sense, I think is what's so strange. And, and, in, and we're really, although it feels like Trump should have represented the conclusion of this sort of realignment, I think we're, we're really still in the very early stages of it. Yeah, so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, the realignment. I, I want to highlight um, a couple counties here to talk through with you guys. So let's start um, with Mahoning County in Ohio, which is where uh, Youngstown is located. Uh, Trump has won that county with 50.3% uh, of the vote, Biden's 48.3%. That represents about a 30% shift uh, towards the GOP uh, since 2012. And um, and, you know, pre-2012, there are very similar results there. So uh, as, as far as kind of the, um, the white working class, um, you know, has that vote kind of solidified around the GOP at, at this point? And is that something that's a, a Trump phenomena or is it a kind of a, a lasting cultural shift um, that will, you know, outlast Trump? So, so Matt, I'll give you that first. Right. Uh, well, um, it didn't start with Trump. Uh, we, we are in the midst of a, a generations long transformation of the Republican Party um, from the party of uh, the Prescott Bushes of the world, um, you know, socially liberal upper crust um, to the party of uh, Sarah Palin and the party of um, uh, Donald Trump is a different profile, but, you know, Donald Trump's the guy from Queens, right? As he said in the, in the final debate, in the second debate, when Biden said, where did you come from? And he said, I came from Queens. And so that kind of speaks a lot to how we think about class in the United States. It's not necessarily how much money you make. It's, um, it's where you're from. It's what level education you've received. 
Um, it's the way that you present yourself in public. So the, you know, the great um, Rodney Dangerfield character in uh, Caddyshack, right? He's, he's part of the country club, but he doesn't fit in and everybody else there hates him because he's kind of uncouth and rough around the edges. Um, so uh, this has been going on for quite some time. And in fact, you can, uh, I'll go back to the sixties again. Um, within two years of Goldwater's defeat in 1966, Actually, within one year, let's go uh, just one year after Goldwater's defeat, William F. Buckley Jr. runs run for mayor of New York City. And he loses, um, but he does something very interesting. He went in, he entered the race in order to prevent the liberal Republican, John Lindsay, from winning. But instead of doing that, he actually ended up splitting the Democratic vote. And he, he gained a lot of his support from exactly this, the so-called white working class, which we T typically mean, take to mean whites without college degrees um, in the outer boroughs of New York City, right? Staten Island, which just went back to the Republicans, by the way, in the House um, last night. So you see there in 1965, and then you see it again in Reagan's uh, first gubernatorial victory in California in 1966, there's improvement among the white working class and among rural areas um, from Richard Nixon's um, failed campaign for governor four years earlier in 1962. So this is now, you know, 60 years, this transformation is going on. And it's led, I think, to the um, the foundation of Donald Trump's coalition. And then that is the white working class rural vote. And what Trump has did last night, uh, he might not win, but we did something very interesting in the South. And, and I think, you know, we can we can definitely see it in the South, but I'm sure it pops up elsewhere. To that white working class coalition, he is now adding uh, Hispanic uh, working class. Again, not necessarily uh, poor um, people, but Hispanics without college degrees and uh, people who are, you know, uh, they can still make a very nice living or a decent living, but they don't have that credential, which is really kind of this totem in American society. And so he's, he's added that. Now, the problem, though, is because of this long transformation I'm describing, the, um, the Republican margins among uh, white professionals, the traditional base of the party, uh, are narrowing as, as those voters are leaving for the Democrats. That's right. So, you know, kind of on that note, one other county uh, I want to look at it here is Cobb County, which is Marietta, Georgia. Uh, kind of home of uh, Newt Gingrich's uh, district when, when he was speaker, and that has moved about 26 points towards the Dems since 2012, with Biden winning it uh, at around 56% of the vote, Trump pulling in about 43%. So, um, so Oren, um, you know, with kind of President Trump, do you think the suburban uh, losses and, and, and shifts, is that, is that a shift, you know, as, as Matt was hinting at from, you know, uh, more professional uh, class folks moving away from the GOP? Or is that a Trump personality problem that is, uh, you know, um, if, a, let's say, a populist Marco Rubio ran, Marietta would, would be right back in, in, in the GOP column? Well, I think part of it's temporary and, and part of it's probably permanent. Um, I, I think Matt described exactly correctly this the, this very long term trajectory. Um, and yet, as you described in, in the poll data, it, it looks much more like this incredible discontinuity. And, and I think the reason for that is that historically, where there was this counter pressure, which is that the, the GOP's economic agenda was not at all friendly to this group that sort of socially and culturally want, wanted to be part of it. And, and so you had a situation where um, while, you know, and, and we always joke about sort of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm socially liberal and fiscally conservative is, is the actually smallest group. It's the socially conservative, fiscally liberal um, crowd or economically left, socially right. Um, that, that's actually the big one. And, you know, I think if, if you take a county like, um, you know, Mahone, you, you have a situation where you know, Republicans might have been culturally aligned, but their economic agenda just seemed totally disconnected from the actual interests of those voters. Uh, whereas I think Trump it represents a real break in speaking directly to the interests of those voters. Um, and, 
and and so that's the way in which I think now talking about Cobb, some of this shift is permanent. I mean, I think, you know, working class voters without college degrees have different interests and therefore policy preferences in some respects and, and concerns and priorities than college educated upper middle class professionals. And that's not to say we can't all be part of the same country and get together. In fact, that we, we'd better be able to do that. And we have been historically. Um, but but it is to say that there are things that are permanently going to be more attractive about the Democratic Party to those voters, whether it's their focus on a sort of college model of, of education and, and career preparation and funding for all of that. Um, or, you, you know, you see it in all these little things like all the fights about the SALT um, tax deduction and this idea that, you know, the, the, the one the one tax that Democrats are always in favor of is, is the one for upper middle class homeowners in, in high tax states. Um, so so I think there's a, a real tension and a trade off of interests and, and you inevitably you inevitably lose some of those um, Cobb voters when when you pivot toward the Mahong ones. Um, the, the flip side, though, is that I think to your point, a lot of what is turned off suburban voters is Trump's personality. And, and there's a real kind of Shakespearean question of to what extent could you have the things that made Trump successful without the things that that made him so repulsive to a different group of people. Um, and, and I think there's there's some room to do that. So I, I think there's room to try bigger coalition. Um, and, and we can talk about who, you know, who, who that politician hypothetically or in practice might be. Um, but so, so there's room to do some of both, but there are also real trade offs. You're not going to keep the entire uh, you know, W. Bush Romney coalition and the entire Trump coalition under the same umbrella. Right. And so one one piece that actually uh, one county that voted um, 42 and a half percent for Bush in 2004, but has been traditionally uh, pretty Democratic is Zapata County in Texas uh, on the border with Mexico. It's 85 percent Latino. Uh, Trump uh, won 52 and a half percent of that county, which represents a 48.6 percent towards GOP since 2012. Um, so, Matt, what, um, what has kind of precipitated uh, this this shift in Latinos uh, towards the GOP? I guess specifically in Texas and and Florida, but also you know more more broadly around the country. Well, um, I'm not sure of the specific causes, um, but I can tell you what um, didn't stop this realignment. And that is the issue of immigration. I'm going to just talk about um, a longstanding debate within conservative circles uh, and also the Republican Party much more broadly. But, um, you know, uh, for about 30 years now, National Review, for the kind of the journal of the conservative movement, uh, has adopted a restrictionist approach to immigration. Um, other journals were much more liberal uh, in their approach to immigration. And after the Romney defeat in 2012, um, there was this RNC autopsy, which came out and said that in order for Republicans to ever win again, uh, they would have to embrace some type of comprehensive immigration reform, which is a euphemism for uh, amnestying uh, illegal immigrants. Now, of course, uh, that's not what happened. Um, the uh, uh, Obama's proposed uh, immigration bill was defeated. Um, and then, uh, of course, the party went and nominated Donald Trump, who immediately began his campaign with a very controversial remark about Mexico not sending its best. Right. Um, and yet he won the presidency. And more, moreover, moreover, it now seems that he has done um, just an incredible job um, uh, among Hispanic voters. After four years of policies uh, that were extremely restrictive, um, not only on illegal immigration, but also in terms of um, asylum and refugee policy, um, he has he uh, liked the Cotton Purdue plan um, to reduce legal uh, migration into the United States. Uh, and yet, after all this time, years and years, ha being told by by liberals uh, and uh, even some conservatives and, and then the entire media and Democratic Party, that immigration is the key to uh, winning the Hispanic vote. Well, uh, conservatives kind of stuck with their 
their idea that no, uh, it's a function of American sovereignty uh, to be able to determine who enters our borders and under what conditions and, what, and how they become citizens. Um, that policy does not seem to have hurt uh, Republicans uh, at all in, in, in this election, which otherwise looks, might go, looks like it might go the, the other way at the presidential level. Right. So, so I think, you know, um, with kind of these three counties in mind and kind of the shifts, I think, uh, in the electorate well addressed, um, I kind of want to shift our conversation towards, um, the conservative movement and the policies and the ideas behind it and kind of how, um, that is going to change or which trends are going to, uh, get highlighted, um, over the next, you know, um, four to, to eight years here. So, um, I have a couple of potential futures sketched out that maybe the GOP might, um, might follow. So, um, the first one, and I think the obvious one is, uh, the staying power of a, a Trump like populism and nationalism. Um, so, so Oren, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, do you think kind of the past four years, the changes and kind of maybe a more um, socially uh, conservative and, um, you know, uh, economically, uh, you know, uh, less uh, orientation towards uh, small government policies? Do you think that shift uh, specifically in conservative policy and intellectual circles uh, is going to continue? I, I think it will. I, I certainly hope it will. Um, and and I guess the the kind of the, the way I would think about it is that I, I don't think there really is a, a kind of Trumpism. I, I think there's just Trump. Um, it and that you know both in in the way he campaigned in the way he governed um, in in the lack of sort of infrastructure uh, that that he's built. Um, I think by default whether he wins or loses the the sort of post trump period it's hard just to know what it would mean for another candidate to sort of carry that forward or or for you know think tanks to to try to support trumpism because i frankly I, I think it's hard to to be concrete about what it means um beyond the rhetorical level uh but but i think what you will see is is this real effort to Kind of take the lessons learned that the the space that Matt described and and do something with it, and and say you know that that a working class coalition, um, a a focus on economic policies to to help workers rather than just assume that whatever generates the most profits will ultimately be best for everybody. Uh, I, I think that way of thinking is is here to stay and and will at least be one of the main. Uh, kind of strands of, of conserv conservatism that's that's contending for influence. Right. So, you know, um, Matt, what do you make of the kind of uh, division between um, President Trump's, I would say, populist and nationalist rhetoric and kind of the policies that were actually passed um, especially on, on, on the economic side, do you think that conflict of, you know, talking working class and then passing, um, largely tax cuts for the working class, but, but, um, things that can be, uh, branded and, and may not have been very popular with that constituency. Do you think that trend of, you know, the establishment running the legislation, but the populace running the rhetoric will continue? Well, you know, you have to take a step back and, try to untangle conservatism and populism. And, um, you know, the populism is actually much older than the conservative movement in the United States. I mean, Donald Trump's uh, political ancestry goes back to Andrew Jackson. It goes back to the Whiskey Rebellion. Anytime Americans or a significant portion of Americans decide that elites are not listening to them, uh, we have an upsurge of populist sentiment. And, um, and that it's kind of like a sine wave through the decades. And uh, Trump is the latest manifestation of that. Now, Trump entered the race to become president um, uh, alienated from the institutions and elites of the conservative movement. And the, remember, there is a great debate during the 2016 campaign about, well, was Trump a conservative? 
or not? Or And if he's not a conservative, does he deserve our support? And at one point in one of the debates, Trump said, you know, I or maybe it was at a rally. He said, I am conservative, but what does it even mean anymore? You know, if you, I am a conservative, I'm not a conservative, whatever, I'm me. And that was the populist side talking. But when he gets into office, um, he combines the two. And so he governs as a cons- as a populist conservative, a national populist conservative. And what does that mean? Well, it means he has the more traditionally conservative issues. So he has a tax cut. Um, he has um, uh, judges, right? He deregulates. But then he adds on it some changes from um, the conservatism uh, of the previous 20 or so years. And so how does he change things? Well, he becomes an economic nationalist. You know, there's a lot, well, he doesn't become, he's always, he's always been one, but he's made the party, I think, much more economic nationalist. Um, and so th- there was a big debate about economic integration, global economic integration, free trade. And this debate was going on in the 1980s, actually, in the pages of National Review, you can see it. Well, the free traders won that debate up until Donald Trump. And so he's kind of changed changed the orientation of cons- of maybe not among elites, but certainly among conservative grassroots uh, types on economic nationalism questions. He, uh, like I said, immigration. He, I think he kind of said, uh, Demo, again, this, uh, this nationalist idea, we will control our borders. We will build the wall. Um, that was uh, a difference from kind of what conservative elites were saying prior to his candidacy. And then extremely important is his shift on foreign policy. And here I think was the place of the greatest estrangement between the conservative elite and Donald Trump and this new Republican party that is coming into being. Um, You know, he not only um, kind of counterattacked against John McCain um, in, in the summer of 2015, but then in the beginning of 2016, I think it was, he not only said that he was against Iraq, he said, George W. lied us into war, which is, you know, it's false, but it, but it, was, the, it was the most extreme thing you can say, right? Um, that, in a way, kind of dis, 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 disenthroned um, the role of uh, a certain group of foreign policy hawks, the members of the foreign policy establishment, um, it, it removed them from their place of influence within the GOP once Donald Trump won. And I don't think they're coming back. So those are three ways that he's changed um, the movement. And the other thing, which is more controversial, the, the other populist thing, which is going to be more, more controversial is he changed. He does not have um, the same conception of limited government as most conservatives. So that is most since the beginning of the conservative movement, Conservatives have believed in limit in a limited government, and they measure this in basically um, reducing the size and scope of the federal government, including in entitlement programs and including in government spending. Uh, Donald Trump, um, he had no problem with big spending when it was on projects he liked. Um, And he also has no. uh, In fact, he pledged again and again that he wouldn't uh, reform entitlements. I think this is one area that will be hotly contested in the years to come, especially under a Biden presidency. Conservatives are going to have to ask themselves, um, do they give a little on this limited government idea in these in these respects? Um, or are they going to hold to their principles and maybe then reduce their influence in the Republican Party? Yeah, I, that's um, I think that's a great rundown of kind of all the the major, you know, shifts we've seen in the last four years and um, kind of the changes to uh, the conception of what being a um, conservative means in, 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 in the time of Trump. So I, I guess my follow up to that to you, Warren, is, you know, um, is there a kind of national populist conservatism that can survive without Trump as a figurehead? Um, you know, uh, assuming that he kind of bows out and isn't a factor beyond um, 2020 if he loses re-election. 
I think there definitely is. I, and, and I think it's really important to, to keep in mind the one other dimension in this in this coalition, which is con conservatism versus versus libertarians. Um, you know, I think if you think about the, the coalition that we have thought of as American conservatism and, and certainly the Republican Party, at least since Reagan, you, you really have three groups. You have uh, economic kind of libertarian free market, small government uh, focused folks. You have social conservatives and you have the, the kind of foreign policy hawks. And uh, that was a very effective coalition. Among other things, it was a, a very wise coalition with which to win the Cold War. And, and it did win the Cold War. So I'm, I'm not here to, to cast aspersions on that as a coalition. Um, but but in effect of it was that I think, you know, essentially the, the conservatives were told you can do social issues and, and the libertarians over here will take care of the economic policy. And, and so what we call conservative these days, I think is, is in, in the economic sphere is really mostly libertarian. I mean, what, you know, what, what Matt was just describing as kind of the, the, the limited government cut spending attitude, um, you know, when it comes to the trade question and so forth, those are, those are sort of very libertarian views. Whereas if you actually go back and look at kind of the history of American economic policy up until, you know, r roughly 1970 something, um, that was that was not the tradition. I mean, from from Alexander Hamilton to Henry Clay to Abraham Lincoln, um, the, William McKinley, there, there was a sort of very strong protectionist bent. There was a heavy focus on investment in in infrastructure in kind of having a robust national economic policy. Um, and, and, and in a sense, I think if, if you kind of actually go back to first principles and ask, you know, we have a long fight here about what exactly does conservatism mean, but, but you think about conservative priorities and, and you look at the challenges we have today, um, you know, I, I think a genuinely conservative economics would, would look very different from, from what libertarians prefer. And, and so one, one dynamic that I think is, is at play here is we're, we're seeing a potential divorce where two groups that both like free markets an awful lot are realizing they actually come to it from a different place, that, that for the libertarian, the, the free market is, is almost just the end unto itself, whereas the conservative wants to know kind of, well, what's the market doing for us? And, and if it's not doing what we need, what are we going to do about that? Um, and, and so I think the sort of the, the conservative... Um, whether you want to append nationalism to it or populism to it. Um, I always struggle with populism because I kind of thought every, like, everyone was trying to do popular things. It's, I mean, I, I struggle to know what, what dis distinguishes a populist from, uh, from, from a non-populist politician. But I, I think that strand of, of actually trying to apply conservative principles to, to solve our problems is, uh, is, is one that is, is, gaining strength quickly that that Trump created the space for and and I hope will become the the dominant approach with within the right of center. So, you know, Matt, with uh, with Oren saying that the libertarians are kind of moving out of the uh, the conservative uh, movement a little bit, you saying the foreign policy hawks moving out a little bit. Uh, what's kind of the you know, the state of fusionism at this point, um, is that kind of our, you know, uh, the three legs of the stool kind of now one leg and, and, and how, you know, intellectually, um, m may that change, uh, the conservative movement? Well, when you, when you think about capital L libertarians, uh, they've been out of the conservative movement, um, since 1969 at the, uh, infamous, uh, young Americans, uh, freedom, uh, meeting uh, and they left over the issue of foreign policy, over the Vietnam War, and over the attitude to take toward America's intervention there. Um, so, um, so let's talk about fusionism. Uh, fusionism is as theorized by Frank Meyer, the um, National Review senior editor, uh, was his. Um, a belief that when you looked at the political principles of the American founding, you um, discovered uh, kind of the rubric for a polity of um, maximum individual freedom within a constitutional and social order. 
And so the phrase ordered liberty uh, came out. And so uh, whether it was in Meyer's reading, uh, writing, whether it was in um, the Sharon statement, which created YAF, uh, conservatives, uh, the conservative movement has always oriented itself toward a particular view of the American founding and American constitutionalism as really securing uh, uh, individual liberty, political liberty um, for its uh, for for Americans, for, for American citizens. And so the conservative movement, what makes American conservatism American is that it's trying to preserve this particular constitutional um, uh, foundational heritage. So um, the, the, this rubric, fusionism, it has always come under attack uh, perennially. In fact, the very word fusionism was kind of a uh, uh, a sarcastic label, a derogatory label, though made in uh, in the spirit of friendship by Brent Bozell, um, who was Myers' big internal critic and then external critic um, from National Review. And there's always been this criticism of fusionism, which is it doesn't specify what it means for freedom. Is freedom um, the freedom to do what you will, or is it freedom to, to do what you Ought, right. And so uh, unless you specify that, then it, you leave um, you may leave yourself open to um, challenges. And by the way, uh, you know, if you say that freedom is the freedom to do what you ought, the more libertarian side is going to attack fusionists. And if you say, well, liber it's liberty to do what you will, then the traditionalists who say, no, virtue comes first are, are going to attack it. every every few years, there's a debate <laughs> over fusionism. The funny thing is, it always kind of seems to stay there. Uh, it, the consensus does kind of seem to hold over time. And my particular theory for why that is, is precisely its, rooted, its rootedness in the American founding. Now, I agree with Oren that when you look at actual American economic policy, uh, it is not kind of capital L libertarian. It's not what Milton Friedman would want. But I actually think the more economic nationalist policies on trade in particular fit within a fusionist frame. Uh, for, as long as you can tie it to the American political tradition, that is the tradition that comes from the founding, um, I, I think it has, a, uh, it has a good claim to be part of fusionism. So, you know, with with that in mind, um, Oren, uh, do you think there's kind of a, a new fusionist uh, coalition or maybe a, a, a different understanding of fusionism uh, that that will kind of shape um, the conservative movement, you know, uh, going forward? That's maybe more forward looking rather than kind of Reagan revolution oriented. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that that economic nationalism on on trade can be part part of a fusionist um, coalition. That uh, I'll be quoting Matt on that frequently, to be sure. You uh, might only hear it from me, but <laughs> noted as noted scholar Matthew Continetti remarked on very little sleep the night after the election. <laughs> go and, and describe it. Um, I you know look, I, I think there's obviously a way in which. Um, elements of, of what we are calling fusionism here have have sort of survived through all of the ups and downs and 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 make sense almost regardless of what else is going on in the world. I mean, for one thing, the, the big question for libertarians is, well, well where are you going to go? I mean, if, if you want to go, you know, try and advise Kamala Harris on, on her policies, have at it. Um, and, and to be honest, I think there are a segment that that are headed that way. I mean, if you look at where progressivism is headed, which increasingly looks to me like a sort of anything goes as long as you pay high taxes so we can redistribute to the people who are being left out. I think libertarians are going to sign up for that over a lot of things conservatives would do, at least in some cases. I, I think it will be very interesting to see that evolution. Um, but, but I do think there's a way, you know, to, to Matt's point about kind of the, the sign function of populism, uh, I, I was never very good at trigonometry, but what's the one called where like the waves are twice as long um, they, I, you multiply something by two, I'm sure. Um, on, on a longer time frame, there are much more kind of structural shifts that do happen in our coalitions. 
And I think that's because things change in the world. Um, the, the types of challenges we face globally and domestically the, and so forth change over time. And, and I think one really fundamental change that we have seen over roughly the last 20 years is that markets are behaving a little bit differently than they used to. And if you go back and look at when Friedman and Hayek were writing, for instance, I, I love to quote Hayek, who's in roughly 1960, kind of using exports and imports will always just find a balance somehow magically. Don't, don't bother asking why, as his example of, of the, the wonders of, of the market. Um, because we were in the middle of a 20 year period when when exports and imports, in fact, just balanced every year. It, it was great. And there's no question there was a period recently in American history when essentially a rising tide did lift all boats and, and the same things that were generating growth um, and, and a push toward deregulation and reducing taxes did, in fact, seem to redound to the benefit of workers and widespread productivity gains and so forth. Uh, and, and roughly around the year 2000, I would say that that just stopped being the case. And, and there it could be a function of globalization. It could be a function of technological change. It could be a function of a lot of investors getting really good at playing in this version of markets and realizing there were an awful lot of ways to make money without actually using workers productively. Um, but whatever it was, I, I think that the way that markets are functioning right now is very different than it was when when Reagan was president. And so I think there's there's a really fundamental question for for policymakers and for the role of government about uh, what do we need to do to ensure widespread prosperity and and how do we apply those principles of the founding or, or those core principles of conservatism to this moment? And, and I think, honestly, how libertarians would approach that is, is fairly incompatible with how conservatives would. Um, and, and so I don't think this is a, a case of, well, we're mad at each other right now, but then next week we'll make up again because we're that couple that always does that. Um, I, I think the world is different. And I think the coalition that makes sense going forward uh, is, is one that is multiracial and um, working class and really conservative in its values, uh, but, but with a different attitude toward markets and a different attitude toward the role that we might want government to play in, uh, in, in supporting prosperity. So um, closing question to you both uh, for me and then we'll do some audience Q and A is, uh, in 2024, assuming uh, Biden holds on uh, in the next few weeks and becomes the next president, um, who, who do you see as the GOP nominee? Start with you, Matt. Um, I have no idea. Uh, and, you know, Henry Olson of uh, the Ethics and Public Policy Center said something the other day that I thought was very wise. And he says, in American politics, the what happens slowly. And so you can pick up on it. Right. And so when I talk about this multi-generational transformation of the GOP, it's hap it's happened slowly. And so I can sit here in my study and I can read the paper and I can see and look at the returns and I see it happening over time. In contrast, Henry pointed out the who in American politics uh, changes rapidly and unpredictably. And I mean, there's just no way for for me to sit here tonight uh, with the election still not called and predict to you who would be the Republican nominee in 2024. Um, when four years ago, or rather say eight years ago, um, uh, who would have said that it, the nominee in 2016 would have been Donald Trump. So I think the, what has happened the what is the, what moves slowly. And we see this transformation, in the GOP, we see modifications over time and what it means to be a conservative, you know, um, I think it was Samuel Huntington who, who said uh, famously in the 1950s that conservatism was a situational ideology. Now, Russell Kirk would disagree with him whether it was it's an ideology at all. Leave that aside. What Huntington meant was it depends on the circumstances. It depends on the institutions that conservatives are defending. And it depends on the historical conditions. Right. There are always commonalities. I think conservatives are anti-revolution. I mean, that's just something that's happened. Now, American Revolution is slightly different, right? Okay, that's the asterisk being American conservatives. But even there, the revolutionaries of 1776, well, many of them went 
and adopted the Constitution in 1787. I think conservatism is fundamentally anti-socialist slash anti-communist. I do think that this is we can see over the history of conservatism everywhere. There's there is a very skeptical attitude toward the state that I think will be hard to overcome because when conservatives look at the state, um, they see it uh, fundamentally as a threat to uh, political liberty. Um, and the concentration of powers in the state is something that conservatives and libertarians uh, have opposed throughout time. But nonetheless, there's always different positions and different um, uh, emphases uh, that we that we can see. And I think that we this conservatism is a more nationalist and more populist uh, today than it and, and will continue to be, I think, in the years ahead. But as to who will lead it, I don't know. And I have to say, um, if this election is as close as it looks like it's, it might turn out to be, you know, uh, Grover Cleveland had two non-consecutive terms. Why can't Donald Trump? Uh, Warren, same question to you. <laughs> I, well, I, I agree with Matt that, that you can't pick a person right now. And, and I think that the who versus the what is, is a wonderful way of, of putting it. Um, I, I do think there is something interesting that we are headed toward, and, and we'll put the, the Donald Trump runs again to the side, at least for the moment, um, which is that, you know, for, for a while now, Republican primaries have been a, essentially a contest of who can sound most like Ronald Reagan. Um, there have been somewhere that there's just been a presumptive nominee. I mean, George W. Bush didn't really face much of a challenge in 2000, in a sense. Um, I remember 96 as well, but I think you would probably say the same about Dole. But but if you think about 2008, if you think about 2012, if you think about what everybody else besides Donald Trump was trying to do in 2016, it was essentially everybody was going running from almost the exact same playbook. And it was just a contest of who could do it best and who deserved to be the standard bearer. Um, and I think what we're going to see heading into 2024 is, is different from that in in exactly the ways Matt and I have been talking about, which is this tension around what comes next. Um, in, in a sense, is it is it a pre-Trumpism? Is it that we, we wish we could have what 2016 would have sounded like if Trump had never showed up on the stage? Or is it more of a post-Trumpism, a the, the more kind of national populist conservatism that, that we've been describing a little bit here? Um, and 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 so that's really interesting and, and fits more, I think, with what we've seen in, in the Democratic Party a little bit in recent years between um, candidates who were essentially trying to replay the Obama um, playbook and, and those who were arguing the Democrats really needed to go in a different direction. And so, you know, I think you can certainly put names in those two categories. Um, you know, I, I don't know who's going to run, but, you know, a, a Nikki Haley, a Ted Cruz, probably a Mike Pence. Um, I, ironically, given that he is the sitting vice president, probably actually sit very comfortably in sort of a pre-Trump lane, um, whereas a, a Rubio, a Hawley, uh, potentially a Tom Cotton, um, a Tucker Carlson, if he runs, um, those sorts of folks, I think, obviously sit in, in a post-Trump lane. And, and so I think it'll be, you know, exactly to Matt's point about the what, the, the long term fight here is about which of those becomes the dominant strand within the right of center and, and which of those lanes does the nominee emerge from. And then the kind of much more tactical good luck guessing a week before Iowa question is which particular person emerges from from either lane and then you know, at least in the short run, even if one lane may be stronger in the long term, but a, a stronger candidate in the other lane can certainly prevail in particularly during a period of transition. I think that's a kind of great uh, closing to, to look ahead. Um, so I'm going to read a little uh, uh, note here. Uh, so tonight's event is just a taste of what ISI offers its student members. Uh, if you're tired of progressive orthodoxy on campus and eager to go beyond the narrow range of debate in the classroom, uh, then learn the timeless principles of liberty with ISI. ISI introduces students to the American tradition of liberty and to a vibrant community of students and scholars. Our members get an education and a community they don't find at their universities. And in the process, they become articulate voices for conservative principles. To get the college education you would serve, uh, we would love to have you become an ISI member. So go to join.isi.org. Um, 
So audience Q and A, we have some good ones here. Uh, I want to start with a question uh, from Sean, and this one will go uh, to you, uh, Matt. So, uh, you know, new forms of fusionism were discussed, uh, but does that any of that lead to the GOP becoming more productive? They did remarkably little with the trifecta uh, of governance and appear to be more inclined to rebuff the Democrats than promote a constructive vision for the country. Right. Well, you know, we always have to distinguish um, the conservative movement from the Republican Party. And um, the truth is, mo uh, many Republican voters do not identify as conservative at all. Um, the very conservative category when you break down the different types of Republican is this is one of the smallest, um, the liberal is the smallest, but, but uh, very conservative is, is next to it. Um, so one of the major um, challenges of the conservative movement uh, since its inception is forcing the GOP to be a vehicle for conservative ideas. And then once the GOP is in power, making sure that these conservative ideas are um, advanced. And look, uh, there have been some successes, but there have also been major failures. Um, so I take the questioner's point. I, I do think, though, you know, um, we can't let the uh, the um, successful nomination of Amy Coney Barrett go unremarked here. When we look at what conservatives have been able to do with the flawed and conservatives can be flawed themselves, but with the flawed institution of the Republican Party. Orrin mentioned earlier the success in the Cold War, something we don't think about now, but which I think conservatives played a major role in and is a world historic achievement. When you look at the direction of the courts, now there are always times where we're disappointed with particular court rulings. But the fact is, in the 1960s, the idea that five of the sitting Supreme Court justices would be members of the Federal Society. And a sixth, John Roberts, he goes wishy-washy. Sometimes he says he was, uh, had a, was a member and other times he, he doesn't say it. But, but to, to sit there when you were living through the so-called Warren Revolution and think that that, would, that court would exist uh, would be fantastical. And yet here we are. And I think there are other achievements. I think um, in terms of social policy, the principle of workfare is something that conservatives worked very hard to to advance and the welfare reform of 1996 despite all the predictions of its failure and the coming immiseration of the poor was a complete success um so so there have been there have been victories but there have also been failures and i'm i think one thing that is becoming ever clearer to conservatives today the major failure is in the realm of culture and this is ironic because the conservative movement in many ways originated as a critique of the academy, right? Buckley's first book, God of Man at Yale, 1951, predates the creation of National Review. And this, this conservatives have recognized since then that the universities were up to no good. And this criticism goes, passes through the decades, 1987, Alan Bloom, The Closing of the American Mind. He foresees the situation we're living in today in that book that's 30 years old. Uh, so um, why haven't we been able to, to have the success as conservatives that we've had in politics and, and in some policy areas, especially in the legal academy? Why haven't we been able to translate to the actual academy? That, I think, is, is a, a space where we really have to direct our critical inquiry because as we as we see again and again, um, for all of our success in politics, losing influence in the culture could could really um, pretend uh, pretend disaster. So uh, a little bit of a um, a follow up on that one to to Oren. Um, this question is from Kurt. So. Uh, in light of the craziness of the left and the Democratic Party, uh, are there not great opportunities now to attract more people to the GOP and kind of what's what's the best way to do this? So, you know, from a cultural point of view, what's what's kind of the um, is there a political or ideological play, I guess, uh, for for conservatives to make? 
I think I think there definitely is, and and I think you know there's a significant degree to what that that what looks like real success um, for the Republican Party right now. Uh, you know, I, I think a tremendous amount of credit needs to go to to the folks running those Senate races who who, who held the Senate if if that holds up, which I believe it will. Um, but but there's a real sense in which th this is more the the Democratic Party failing and and pursuing a an agenda that is so radical on on some of these um, for one thing on on the cultural questions that that Matt just described that that they're they're alienating their own constituents um, and you know we we joke about the you know the the Latinx Latinx I however one pronounces it that that apparently vanishingly few latino people use um that kind of stuff i think is is driving what was once a core part of the the democratic coalition right into the republican party's arms um and so th there's an element of don't screw this up and there's an element of well how do you actually don't don't just be kind of receiving something how do you attract it and 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 then support it and and serve it um and and so that's where i think you know there there's an element of this that's economic um and 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 having policy that that addresses those folks concerns um and and there's an element that it's that's cultural and and this is a place where i i think we can um, do better than 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 Trump has done in in building a a, a conservatism um, where, where you take an issue like immigration, where um, you know yes, there's been progress and 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 an, and an uptick in in the vote share with minorities. I think there's a, a heck of a lot more room for progress if you if you show that you can talk about these principles of of national sovereignty and controlling borders and enforcing the law. And, and do that in a way that shows that that is also consistent with American principles and values, as opposed to doing it in a context that also is just just very alienating to an awful lot of people. Um, I, I don't think the alienating element is sort of integral to the message in, in that respect. So I, I think recognizing that a, a healthy um, winning coalition in, includes, um, in a sense, what are refugees from from the old Democratic Party. And and making sure that that to some extent the policies, but just as much the rhetoric um, and and the self conception of of what is conservatism, what is the Republican Party, what is the right of center, um, that those things have have a place for new people, um, and 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 that 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 can be their home. I think is is really important, um, and and so I think that's something that um, that that actually kind of building that that future foundation really has to focus on. Yeah. So, uh, Matt, a question for you here from Manuel. And I, I you know, um, thinking back to 2016, I think this is actually an interesting question. Um, so so how does the influence of uh, of the alt right and kind of the um, neo reactionary movement on this election compared to 2016? I mean, I remember, um, you know, four years ago, kind of the prevalence of Steve Bannon and Breitbart and um, you know, uh, something that kind of seemed ascendant uh, in conservatism at, at that moment, which is now kind of post Charlottesville pretty much uh, fell apart. So, so what are your thoughts on, on that? That's right, uh, Ryan. I, I, I think Charlottesville uh, basically was the, um, uh, the end uh, of, of, of the alt-right's ability to infiltrate uh, mainstream conservatism. Um, it, obviously, uh, the holders of those views still exist. Um, they've been denied many tech platforms. Uh, so that in that sense, their voice has been um, diminished. Um, I, I also think a big moment here was when uh, Milo Yiannopoulos's um, appearance at uh, the CPAC conference in the first year of Trump's presidency was canceled. Um, that I think kind of closed another door uh, for Milo um, and his and his and his following to become uh, mainstreamed. Um, so I so if you think about it, um, 
in this election, it seems to me, it's not the alt-right that's played a role. It's the so-called intellectual dark web, right? Which is Barry Weiss's uh, term for the type of people that Oren was just describing who are liberals, um, but who are seriously turned off by um, the ideology of woke um, and um, social justice. And uh, and th these voices, I think, have become more prominent in our, in our discussions as the um, as the alt right has has faded away. Yeah, no, that, that that certainly seems right, and I think that uh, that intellectual dark web followers have only grown. I think as cancel culture has has expanded, so um, that's that's certainly a trend to look at. Uh, so, last question uh, here to you, Warren. Um, this is from Jane. Is is it worth considering the demographic of retirees who are comfortably off uh, when when thinking about the conservative movement? Um, on paper, Jane says she would appear to be a Democrat. She's she's a Vassar alumna and uh, has a master's and PhD, but but she is a Trump supporter and she lives in California. Um, so so how how many voters like that are there, and is there kind of a um, I guess you could say a more traditional patrician GOP voter uh, that that has kind of moved with the party um, and supports Trump. How you know how do they fit into the coalition? Are they kind of large enough to be a factor going forward? I, I'm not sure quite how many there are. Um, I, you know, in, in general, I think obviously uh, older populations vote at the highest levels and well off older populations, particularly finance, most of what goes on in our politics. So uh, I think there's certainly a relevant constituency. Um, I, I think ultimately the, the, the question that's going to come for a lot of folks who are, are fairly well off or comfortable is what are the interests that, that drive their, their political preferences. Um, you know, I, I, I think if you're talking about folks in the working class, there are going to be clear, concrete reasons to prefer the agenda that, that conservatives are putting forward. Um, if, if, if you're either, you know, the upper middle class professional in Cobb County or, or a retiree in California, um, a lot of the questions, you know, I can kind of think of, of three things that, that might motivate you. Um, you know, one is, well, what are the policies that are best for me personally and will, you know, best protect my wealth, make me happiest with conditions in my community, be best for my kids, et cetera. Um, that, that group, I suspect, will um, find the progressive message and at least the actual things progressives do uh, to be friendlier. Uh, one is what makes me feel good. And for folks who are sort of integrated into the elite culture uh, and and media and, you know, don't want to feel like they're being yelled at by people during Oscar acceptance speeches, um, that, again, will be a very strong reason to identify with with the progressive party. Uh, and, and then there are those who I think will will be more motivated by by a sort of solidarity rationale um, and and a feeling that they want to be. Um, sort of part of the the coalition that is, you know, helping what they may remember they were 50 years ago, um, or or at least those they they see out there sort of trying to make it, and 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 that's the group I think that um, that conservatives can probably speak to most effectively. Um, I but but I am the last person to tell you how <laughs> how many people in that group would would break in any of those three directions. Great. Well, thank you uh, so much, Matt and Oren, for joining us tonight on uh, probably some, some short sleep and some naps. Uh, and um, uh, I, I hope the audience got, uh, got a lot out of this and um, has kind of a good framework to, to think about the next uh, few years of the GOP and the conservative movement. So um, thank you both. Uh, you know, I encourage any students on to go to join.isi.org and uh, attend some more of these. And um, you know, look out for the next episode of Conservative Conversations uh, that's coming up, I think, with Rod Treyer. So that should be interesting. Thank you both. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you.